Hey, everybody, and uh, I want to welcome you all to another edition of our Inside Edge uh, live industry panels. Uh, we've got, you know, another great selection of speakers tonight. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're actually living in some really, really interesting times right now. And I think, you know, we're bringing in some folks that got a, that have a you know, strong sense of the industry. Uh, my name's Matt Ackley. Uh, I am uh, the chief marketing officer of Ritchie Brothers. And, you know, as we've discussed before, you know, in these times of COVID, when we can't get together at live auction sales, you know, we want to keep that spirit up, keep that, you know, industry networking uh, energy uh, in the room. And so, you know, we, we're coming to you kind of live on the Internet. Um, I'm actually coming to you from Europe. Uh, you know, I got up this morning and, you know, was working out in the gym and I'm looking at the, the European news cycle and, you know, I'm seeing on Sky TV, I'm seeing uh, shortages in the UK with, uh, you know, fuel prices and Brexit and all that. I'm seeing chip shortages coming out of the, the Asian news centers. And then, you know, obviously we've got, you know, the big vote in, in the US today on the infrastructure. And I think we got a great panel to, you know, discuss all these issues that are, you know, specifically affecting uh, the construction space. So, you know, as a reminder, we want this to be interactive, you know, submit your questions. Uh, we will we will interject them throughout or answer them at the end. You can do so by typing it into the Microsoft Teams chat. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce our panel. Uh, once again, another great list of guests tonight. And, you know, Bob, let's start with you. And why don't you take it away and tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Matt. I uh, appreciate the kind invitation to participate. My name is Bob Lanham. I'm the president of Williams Brothers Construction, a bridge and road builder headquartered in Houston, Texas. But I'm the sitting uh, president of the Associated General Contractors of America, which is uh, a construction association that basically spans the industry with, with the exception of the home builders. Uh, we have about 27,000 members across the the country and uh, it's been a real treat to be able to uh, uh, lead this organization uh, and be a part of addressing a lot of unique problems that are uh, befalling us in, in the last uh, 18 months. Ron? Great, well thanks Matt. Uh, it's uh, Ron Glenn here. I'm the uh, CEO of the Alberta Road Builders and Heavy Construction Association. It's uh, uh, the largest uh, heavy construction association in, in Canada, nowhere near the size of uh, Bob's group. We have about uh, 800 members and uh, we uh, have uh, companies that are involved in uh, uh, the heavy construction industry. And so that includes uh, the public space of uh, public roads and bridges and uh, industrial uh, site developments and uh, pipelines and uh, any other uh, industrial development that uh, disturbs the ground. Thanks for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity and looking forward to the discussion. Good, so uh, hi guys, I'll pick up from there. My name is Doug Rush. I am the Managing Director of Rouse Sales. Great to be with everybody this afternoon. Uh, for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with Rouse, we joined the Ritchie Brothers family in the fourth quarter of last year. And at Rouse, um, you could best think of us as almost a measuring stick for the used equipment industry. We collect data and think very deeply about the trends valuation and volume and otherwise that are impacting the used equipment market. So look forward to sharing some of those insights with you here today. Thank you, Doug. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Doug all up here. I'm uh, the senior vice president for Ritchie Brothers based in our head office of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I've been in the industry for about 30 years and 25 of those with Ritchie Brothers. So I've spent lots of time uh, whether it be uh, on the road, in the office, uh, watching to see what's going on these days and uh, look forward to discussions about what the market's doing currently uh, throughout our call here today. Thank you. Great guys. And uh, so let's uh, let's get to the list of questions, you know, that we hear often. I think, you know, we got a great, you know, perspective today. We've got, we've got north of the border and we've got south of the border. 
Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, as I mentioned before, we've got, you know, I'm over here in Europe and, you know, I, I, you know, I think these are some of the topics we've been, we've been talking about for, you know, as Bob mentioned, you know, it's been an interesting ride this, these last 18 months, right? You know, uh, supply chain issues, labor shortages, you know, as I mentioned before, we've got, you know, there's a vote going on in, in, in Congress today, you know, they're, they're pushing the infrastructure bill. And so we know all of this is affecting, you know, the way we, you know, the way we go about work in this space is, you know, and specifically, you know, some of the things we deal with at, at RB and that's around used equipment prices, right? And we're seeing some interesting things there. So Doug, let's turn to you, Doug R. And uh, why don't you kick us off with some of the things we're, we're seeing on the supply chain side and the pricing side? Yeah, so I can uh, share a couple of thoughts here and, and Doug Olive, feel free to pick up. Um, you know, so we do find ourselves in a really interesting time right now. Uh, Matt mentioned a bunch of the trends at the outset that are impacting the used equipment space. Uh, shortages of equipment, quite frankly, rippling through supply chains and what's what that's causing, and I think everybody feels it, is tight supply. Uh, you can see some data on the page here that measures new equipment orders versus production of construction equipment. And these, these two lines never really perfectly align. And that's the nature of the beast. You can't just spin up a brand, uh, you know, a plant quickly. You can't shut it down quickly. There's a lag effect in our industry that creates some unique supply demand dynamics. And we find ourselves in one of those environments right now. Uh, I think if we move the page forward, we'll have a quick peek um, you know, actually, in fact, Doug, maybe uh, Doug Olive, I'll let you address this page if, if, if that's all right. Yeah, that sounds good, Doug. Thank you. Um, so just to, to Doug's point, I mean, one of the things that uh, for sure, we're not just talking about the construction business, of course, but overall construction, when you take in all of our contractors that we deal with and end users on a day to day basis and whether or not they own transportation assets or agricultural assets or pickup trucks for their fleet purposes. We're seeing the demand is just amazing throughout any of those classes, just for the fact that whether it's the chip shortage, the labor shortage, the COVID issues, uh, the demand is well outpacing supply. And because of that, for sure, we're seeing um, at, at the end of the day, whether it's on any of our platforms, we're just seeing very, very strong pricing and demand. And this slide here just kind of highlights um, what our end users are doing. So when the end users are outpacing, uh, they're they're sourcing equipment through us, and it's 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 probably the highest levels we've seen in quite a long time. And quite frankly, when we look at the differential between retail pricing to to auction pricing, there's probably never been a point in time where we've seen those two values closer than in today's marketplace as well. Yeah, Doug, maybe I'll, I'll just pick up on one other point here. I, I think you're exactly right. Um, you know, in a world where I, that last that last chart I find I really find quite striking. If you think about those end users, where's that demand, let's call it, coming from? You know, I would guess a lot of that demand often goes to dealers to buy equipment, right? End users often go to dealers to buy used equipment. But you know what? When utilization on rental assets, which is a big part of where dealers source their used equipment, when that utilization rates are north of 80% where they are today on many asset classes, and then you figure another 10 or 15 at percent of their fleet is you know, in some state of between rents or down for maintenance. The reality is there's just not a lot of equipment in the dealer community right now to meet end user demand. So I think what you're seeing here is you know, simply by virtue of tight supply, uh, those end users are looking to the Ritchie Brothers channels. They're trying to find uh, a piece of equipment to service their need. And if you flip forward to the next slide, that tight supply is driving, exactly as you said, Doug, increases in prices. Right now, when supply is tight and demand is high, we should expect strong used equipment recoveries. And we see that. Rouse tracks uh, retail data from about 200 market participants. They actually share their detailed transactional data with us. And when we look at that data over time, we can really pick up on how the markets are shifting. And what you can see on this chart is when we look at retail equipment pricing, used equipment pricing, just since the beginning of this calendar year, uh, we see values are up 10% for like assets. So that is that effect showing up in price. I mean, to a certain degree, this is basic economics 101. Uh, supply is tight, demand is strong. We should expect increasing pricing. We see it on the retail side. I know it's showing up on the auction side as well. 
So let's, um, you know, I mean, so so there, the, there's the data, right? We're seeing it. We're seeing it in, uh, uh, we're seeing it in the pricing. You know, we see it in the listings. You know, you even, you know, you know, you know, Doug, to your dealer point, right? You look at, you know, you know, we run a listing service as well. You look at, you know, Richie List or Mascus, and you know, dealers don't have a lot of equipment on their, uh, you know, on their lots. And you know, as we see, it's reflected in the, in the pricing for, you know, some of the other marketplaces. So let's kind of dig into some of the, you know, the 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 trends that are, you know, kind of causing all that. And, uh, you know, you know, let's, you know, let's let's scratch the surface and go underneath and see, uh, you know, what's going on out there that's uh, driving some of this data. And so, Ron, you want to kick us off on on kind of what's going on with the, you know, what we're seeing out there from a labor issue. Sure. So uh, Alberta is uh, sort of counter cyclical. Uh, to the rest of Canada because of our uh, over-reliance really on the oil and gas sector. And in the last uh, year of the commodity cycle boom, 2014, uh, we saw price declines and uh, then followed by tremendous investment declines in the oil and gas business here in Alberta. And that had a, a huge impact on, uh, on business and on labor. And so we're now in, in basically the fifth year of that recession. So labor has left the industry and uh, we get into a pandemic. Government wants to uh, stimulate the economy and they look to uh, to uh, invest in, in road infrastructure and bridge infrastructure and we just don't have the labor to be able to supply it. So labor prices uh, have increased a little bit, but it's not just the uh, the price of labor because it's uh, it's a very attractive industry. We pay very high wages here in Alberta for for labor, but they can't rely on our industry because governments uh, have uh, created a roller coaster in funding, and that just creates a lot of stress. and And so labor leaves. And then if you have uh, government programs that are helping to assist them through the pandemic, the incentive to come back to the workforce is just not not there. So even though we have unemployment, uh, um, unlike the rest of the country actually right now in construction, but we have uh, we have unemployment. We can't attract those workers because the the future for them just doesn't seem to be bright because we've been through this before. The season ends and then we can't uh, uh, promise them work next year because of our budgeting cycle, the way that uh, Canadian governments budget. They just don't have the certainty that there's gonna be a job for them uh, again next year. Yeah. You know, there, a li little bit of internet lag, apologize. You know, to kind of jump in there. That first headline you got up on your slide, really, I think, uh, points to one of Ron's comments is the volatility in our funding has been, uh, and right now we've got a, a, our, Federal Highway uh, bill snarled up in politics in Washington, D.C., and it expires tonight at midnight. And uh, in the state of Texas, that's 30% of our funding right there uh, at risk. When you are uh, amidst an industry that is funded by user fees like motor fuels taxes, uh, registration fees and you go through a COVID shutdown and nobody's driving and things, the revenues and receipts, then we were, we were of uh, Texas as a strong oil uh, producing state and a lot of revenues off and a lot of revenues feed into uh, our highway program here. And when we had the uh, beginning of last year, uh, the little tussle going on between uh, Russia and the Saudis and dropping in the dropping of oil prices. Uh, we had the convergence of numerous things that drug our tax receipts down that were funding funding our program. It's always been hard to attract people to our industry. You know, uh, it, uh, it, what whatever drives it we think I, i'm convinced that our education system doesn't promote uh, trades anymore uh college graduates instead of 
uh, working with your hands. I'm hoping that we're seeing that evolution, but I'm telling them unless they solve the funding problem as an underlying premise, Ron and I will never be able to solve the labor problem. Uh, if we got reliable careers out there, predictable careers, where these young people will be winner, willing to enter our business, they know they can stay and they've got some security, we will be able to attract people. I promise you, because we, we pay well above markets as well. Our whole industry does. And, and so we're offering careers. AGC of America just all launched a, um, a workforce development program nationwide, trying to partner with various states, pushing the message that construction is essential, come be a part of an industry that is not susceptible to uh, to the shutdowns other parts of the economy are in the event of like a pandemic. You know, it, it, it's interesting you mentioned that, Bob, because, um, you know, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm over here in Europe and I actually spend a lot of time in Sweden. My, my wife's Swedish and, you know, the whole vocational trade training, you know, element over there, very strong, yep. right? It, you know, people, you know, that is a strong part of their educational system. And, you know, you see it, you know, even my family members on the Swedish side, they go into the trades, right? And that's just, you know, something you're not seeing, I, I don't think, as much in North America. And I know we've heard about trying to copy that, uh, some of that, you're, you know, the Germans do it really well, too. Um, you know, that's it, that's it, you know, that, that, that whole cyclicality, the funny thing, that, that's a very, very interesting insight there. Well, Matt, you know, just to chip in one more on, on that point is our industry collectively, the equipment industry, the material supply industry, the contractors, the engineering design community have all ramped up since the advent of the interstate highway system in 1956. It, we've grown from the original bill was $955 million, and here we are looking at trying to spend $350 billion. The industry has always responded to a reliable, predictable program, and we've invested in ourselves at all elements, at all layers, and have delivered to the taxpayers what was expected. If they would just put that funding up there, we'll do it. We'll make the investments in our companies. You know, Matt, I was before we move off of this topic, I was I was just going to share one other thought on um, the labor shortage from a data angle, because these dynamics we're talking about very real and they actually show up in uh, sort of curious ways when we look at uh, demand data and valuation data in equipment. Um, the practical reality is you're you know, one of the ways you solve a labor, sh labor shortage is you've got folks using equipment that don't necessarily have the expertise that perhaps you're used to in the past. And so what we've actually seen in valuation data is things like um, technology on dirt equipment that can do some of the more complicated work. That is more in demand now than ever. The manufacturers are equipping technology on more machines, and a lot of uh, you owners of equipment are actually pursuing aftermarket technology, bolting it onto their machines, and able to realize a really good return on that investment when they sell the machine. Because quite frankly, if you're buying it, you know you're going to have a less qualified user of it potentially, and that can help sort of bridge that gap. We see the same thing with manual transmissions versus automatic transmissions on, on highway trucks. Uh, it used to be you had to have a manual transmission because the driver wanted to shift gears. It was part of the fun. Well, today you got folks driving trucks that don't know how to use a manual transmission. Um, so you see a lot. Uh, we're actually seeing an increase in value on manuals. I beg your pardon, on automatics, because you need that to plug into the labor force that you have access to. Yeah, I mean, absolutely fascinating sort of the ramifications of of all of this throughout the, the industry. And it's just, you know, it, it's I, I don't I, you know, I mean, I don't know if we see an end in sight, but um, it's certainly going to take some structural changes, I think, to you know address some of these things. Very fascinating. So let's talk about some other factors, uh, you know, you know, mega projects and climate and things like that, you know, uh, you know, Bob, Ron, you know, give us your perspective on on some of the stuff you're seeing around, uh, you know, these impacts. I can kick off on this one. Uh, 
mega projects, uh, I think in, in at least in Canada, it's it's not really so much that the, the projects are getting bigger. It's that the uh, owners, particularly public sector owners, are trying to bundle projects and uh, shift the risk over to the private sector for all these projects. So uh, what would have been a, uh, you know, an LRT light rail transit project that would have been delivered by, you know, a municipality over a number of years, they bundle it up into a public private partnership uh, for, for good reasons, but it also shifts a tremendous amount of the risk in these projects down to the uh, engineers and the uh, ultimately to the construction companies. So what we've seen is that uh, owners are shifting the risk down. They're becoming less uh, uh, willing to resolve issues uh, in the day because they're looking for cost certainty. And so all the risk is being pushed down to the contractors. And uh, when you get into some of these large complicated projects, you really need to have an owner that is involved and interested and willing to work with the contractors. And what we're seeing here anyways, is just this uh, reliance on on uh, financial models that shift all the risk. And uh, that's creating you know, a lot of stress on uh, profit margins. Ron, I agree with you 100%. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, the same thing happening in the US. Uh, there's been a couple of research papers that's come out from noted entities. The, these mega projects, though uh, uh, maybe a convenience from a management aspect of the various owners of the projects, uh, they cease being a way to design, build, and deliver a project and have become more of a risk transfer document rather than uh, trying to put a, uh, infrastructure in place. Uh, most places, most governments, uh, at least in the U.S., Ryan, are uh, sovereign immune. And so uh, why not retain risk if you're, you're, you possess sovereign immunity? State of Texas is a sovereign immune state. Why would they push risk to their contractors when the least cost and best way to manage that would be to retain the risk? And it ends up uh, wasting, in my view, uh, limited dollars that we have. Because despite all this extra funding we're talking about, the needs still outpace the funding. And we can't afford uh, to waste a dollar. We got to get them in as many of these dollars actually into the actual infrastructure itself and not into programmatic or risk transfer issues that don't produce a bridge to drive on or pavement to drive on. You know, it, we we got to be smarter than that. What are some of the things around, you know, you know, you know, you know, I mean, I, you know, let's talk climate change a little bit, right? We had the some of the, you know, the wind problems, the, the electricity problems in Texas and mm -hmm. you know are, are you guys seeing an impact on your ability to I, I don't know what it is work year round you know I live out you know when I'm not in Europe I'm on the I'm in California and I know the number one thought on everybody's mind out there is water um, and uh, you know that's geez, that's going to come to a head soon you know how's that affecting you guys you know north and south of the border well, I think on the north side, uh, we have a very short construction season here because of, of our climate. Uh, so in some ways, uh, a longer construction season is a, a benefit to us a bit. But uh, water is, is going to be in tremendous shortage uh, east of the Rockies. And uh, I don't think our governments are, are prepared to face what needs to happen. And those are going to be some mega projects for water storage and for uh, water treatment. And it's just not being uh, discussed and, and planned for at this time. And that just adds on to the other uh, deficit in infrastructure that we have in Canada that we're just not keeping up with the uh, productivity enhancements and in infrastructure that are necessary to, to allow the economy to grow. So there's a, a double-edged sword there on, uh, on climate change issues for us. Well, Ron, we're lucky down in Texas because uh, uh, construction season is year round. 
uh, with the exception of maybe some isolated weather events, but we generally expect to work year round. What I see is the climate change aspect is that's all in the discussions in our in the reauthorization of our federal highway bill and trying to address climate change in the planning and development of projects and consideration of global warming in, in those aspects. And I appointed a task force at AGC of America to examine this. We got to be in the room trying to help form policy on this. Uh, I'm not, we're not going to debate whether it's right or wrong. We deal in realities and the reality is this is going to be there and we're going to have to contend with it. How do we do it in a responsible way so uh, we protect our markets and we actually do something that actually might actually help the uh, environment? You know, and that means uh, being a part of the education process. Uh, it's fascinating to me that how uh, specifiers on projects, designers, engineers, architects, how little they have a grasp of of the supply chain, where things come from. It'd be really easy to specify in a certain location like Houston that we want a low carbon cement used in this project. Well, but I've got to burn a billion gallons of diesel bringing it in from the West Coast or I could use something local here and where the actual carbon footprint would be better off using the local as opposed to specifying. So we got to be in the room at, uh, uh, helping them address this and educating them about all the implications of their decision. And it, the process can't be so rigid that it doesn't allow each region to adapt to what their particular uh, economies and markets provide to a given project. I can tell you the second half of that bullet about weather resiliency is you know, important to uh, the Gulf Coast, you know, surviving Harvey and hurricanes, uh, you know, understanding what it does to the region when things flood, how fast can we recover and get things moving again? That's uh, that's a big, a big issue. And uh, I, my answer is I build you anything if you got enough money, but the problem <laughs> is, is there reaches a point in all this, Matt, that uh, how much is how much cost is society willing to bear on this, and what is it? What is the reasonable limit on that? And I don't know the answer to that question, uh, but we're going to fool around and find it by accident, I believe. Well, speaking of money, right? Let's. <laughs> uh, why, why, you know, nice segue there. Why don't you, uh, why, why don't you talk us through what's going on in Washington right now? I mean, I know you've got your, you know, you're, you're working on that stuff and, uh, um, you know, I'm, help us yeah, understand what do you think is going to happen there? What do I think is going to happen? Uh, I wished I was smart enough to answer that question. Then I might be sitting in one of those chairs up there solving the problem. But uh, there's two infrastructure bills in Washington. The one we our industry cares about is the 1.2 trillion uh, infrastructure bill. It was a bipartisan bill that come out of the Senate sitting over in the House uh, as a pretty good bill. The whole bill uh, wraps up our reauthorization of our highway program and a lot of these other programs and and pluses up and adds money to that uh probably to the tune of another five six hundred billion so of that 1.2 trillion about five six hundred is new money in there uh but the beauty of that bill is it's all on hard asset it's on true infrastructure like that slide indicates the house of representatives because they they view the 3.5 trillion dollar infrastructure bill and i really hate them calling that this is the human infrastructure bill it's soft social spending uh climate change paid leave you know labor issues immigration child care you name it all rolled up in that they're holding our hard infrastructure bill up and leveraging this against the uh, the social bill and that's the center of the debate. And right now, 
where it is, is they've tied the two together in the House. And if we can't decouple those things in the debate in Washington, uh, we could, our program could lapse tonight. And then we will be scrambling to try to get them to pass a continuing resolution so we can continue to operate. So, uh, and, and you can see in the slides, the critical things, climate, uh, all kinds of, may, uh, uh, made in USA is going to be a big, big thing in all of this. Uh, we just got to don't have a problem with that in the least bit, but it, it needs to be done with true understanding of the markets out there uh, when, when that happens. So, aren't you yeah, on the next? Are they going to pass it? What's... Are they going to pass it? Be a good answer. This is a good slide. We just get a snapshot. The you know yeah. you can see what all the hard assets there. They're doing it. And the beauty of this is it doesn't add to debt. This is already appropriated monies that are sitting there that haven't been spent, it, uh, spent yet. So uh, it doesn't add to the debt. A uh, lot of rhetoric out there that says it does add. It, that's wrong. It does not. And unfortunately, we weren't able to get any motor fuels tax increases or anything, but there's no corporate income tax uh, uh, increases associated with this. So from a standpoint of our industry, we're really happy with this bill. If if we'd have passed a bill during the Trump administration, I can promise you it would have looked very, very similar to this. And, um, you know, Ron, you know, what, what's it looking like? You know, what, what, what's the Canadian government thinking? What are they doing? Yeah, well, I, uh, I'm i glad we had this, uh, found this uh, picture of what someone that's uh, green with envy looks like. Uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, Canada and the United States look at infrastructure differently. And the federal government in the United States, you know, regardless of uh, partisanship, has always found a way to fund hard infrastructure because they understand its connection to growing the economy. It's essential. And uh, unfortunately, in Canada, the way our system works, most of the hard infrastructure is left up to individual provinces to fund as well as funding a lot of that uh, human infrastructure. But I agree with Bob, I don't like the, the term of that, the social spending side of things. So we've just come through a federal election here, which is called in our in our system, because we have a parliamentary system, the uh, minority uh, prime leader, prime minister called a very cynical election right in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, we ended up with the exact same result that we had going into the election. And the uh, so the the current federal government here can can operate for a, a few more years, but their interest is in the social spending side of things, and they see uh, rebounding economy by way of uh, income redistribution, and it's it's not going to work. So I'm I'm green with them. I think uh, something will happen, and uh, when Bob gets a bill, it'll be a, a five year funding. Uh, agreement that provides a runway for businesses to be able to have you know a certain degree of predictability and to be able to invest and unfortunately in Canada that's not the way it works um, for example uh, in in the bill that uh, Bob was talking about there the uh, federal government of the United States invests in airports and in Canada the airports are leased to local authorities and uh, the federal government uses them as revenue sources, not as key economic uh, builders of our economy. They do invest in ports uh, because uh, and border uh, facilities because those are clearly within federal jurisdiction. But it's up to our, our provinces to do things. And uh, in Canada, uh, the current government also doesn't recognize the value of the oil and gas industry to to Canada's economy mostly because it's it's centered in Alberta because of our uh, oil sands and the uh, hydrocarbon resources that we have here and although I promise not to get into a bit of a rant in our uh, our pre-sessions it's it's quite striking and I think we're we're headed for some some uh, inflation and further currency depreciation here in Canada because if you looked at the last year of the commodity super cycle in 2014, I was just checking my numbers this morning, and oil and gas exports, primarily to the United States, were in 2014 were 
of all of Canada's exports. So mostly coming from the province of Alberta. That was $120 billion US of exports going to the United States. Now that drove up our currency. Uh, in 2014, our uh, dollar to the US dollar was actually averaging about a dollar eight. And so what that did was it uh, reduced uh, 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 manufacturing uh, price competitiveness in Eastern Canada, but it led to the opportunity to import uh, equipment and machinery to improve our economy. 2015, oil and gas collapses because of uh, the uh, Russia-Saudi um, issue that, that, that happened. We, we lost a lot of our productivity here. So in the, in the last year, in 2020, uh, instead of 25% of the value of all Canada's exports, oil and gas dropped down to 16%. And instead of 120 billion US, it dropped down to 62 billion. So a 50% decrease. And that's uh, our largest export uh, in dollar terms and in volume, volume terms uh, to the United States. The next largest is automobiles, and that's at 11 uh, percent of the of our exports as a as a nation. So our the impact of that price decline and the lack of demand from the United States uh, led to a drop in our currency from a dollar eight. Uh, today it's trading at seventy nine cents. It dropped even uh, further before that. So that's a twenty nine cent depreciation, twenty six percent depreciation in our currency. So it has the appearance uh, for Eastern Canada that our that our that our exports of manufacturing products are going up, but really we're just selling them at a discount of 30%. So what we're seeing here, I think in Alberta in terms of equipment is that it's, uh, it's uh, very attractive to buy heavy equipment out of Canada and probably move it to the States. We, we lost a lot of equipment here in, Al in Alberta over the last five years. And uh, the ability for, uh, for uh, Alberta companies now to try and uh, take advantage of a little bit of a dead cat bounce in oil and gas and some stimulus spending from government. It's driving prices uh, up astronomically to the point where uh, early in this uh, construction season, uh, our, uh, our local Ritchie brothers here in, in uh, Alberta had some very large sales. And I think that was because there were companies that made a decision that it's better to sell equipment then take a risk and try and meet the demand of a government that can't that can't budget more than uh, a year or even six months in advance. So that was my rant. Sorry about that, but those are striking numbers. And uh, Canada is in a bit of a uh, a position here. I think there'll be uh, more inflation and uh, and more uh, currency devaluation. Um, there's a bit of a, a pickup in oil and gas. But we can't build pipelines either. Uh, the politics around pipelines has basically killed any opportunity for an expansion in our capacity to export. Uh, so what that's going to do is uh, potentially create an opportunity to do more value added products here in Canada, but that's going to have to be shipped on the surface. And if uh, governments uh, being the monopoly owners of roads aren't in, in investing in, in surface transportation uh, as they are doing in the in the United States, we're going to be at a tremendous uh, productivity disadvantage. Um, and, and I think that leads into our, our next, you know, some of our next slides. Uh, real quick though, we got a, we got a question. Um, it was interesting, you know, a question about the, uh, you know, the, the two infrastructure bills and our discussion of the uh, of the workforce earlier. Um, you know, is there anything in that human infrastructure bill, you know, Bob, that you think will address some of that, those workforce issues we, we, we talked about earlier, you know, whether it's training or, or, or whatnot, some of the vocational things? I'm not sure if you understand, Bob. Yeah. Any thoughts there? Bob, I think you're on mute.
Hey, Bob, I think you can you un your, your, unmute your computer. All right, let's move on to the, um, you know, Doug, um, yeah. Doug, why, why don't we jump into, oh, there we go. We got okay. you now. Uh, for some reason, I've got a terrible lag and my finger is not patient enough to wait on, so I click it too many times. Uh, the, uh, I think there's going to be some uh, in uh, uh, the human infrastructure bill, what shape or form it's going to look at. I mean, whole notion of free college and those things. I, I don't want to push. Frankly, we don't need pushing more people to college. We need to be pushing more people to trades. And there is a terrible imbalance in, in the American funding. Uh, college bound kids, there's six dollars for uh, invested in that for every one dollar in the trades. And that's a terrible, terrible imbalance that we've got to work. Uh, we're, we're continuing to push that. I'm hoping I'm hoping that we can make more. But that's a long term investment in uh, uh, our workforce that takes takes years to play out because you're talking about training of the kids. What do we do today? And I think immigration reform is going to be the first key to dealing with and getting an immediate impact to workforce needs. Got it. OK, hey, let's jump into some of the pricing uh, discussion and I've got a, I've got a question from the audience as we go along here about the the you know we, we talked about the equipment flowing from Canada to, to the US so you know Doug o, maybe you can talk about you know some of the bidding trends you're seeing in Edmonton you know when you, when we look you know you know we see in US bidders and our Canadian auctions or not but uh, let's jump into some of you know we talked about inflation we talked about labor shortages we talked about tight supply you know you know, if this infrastructure bill comes along, I mean, I don't think that's going to make the situation even better. Uh, you know, more work, you know. So, you know, Doug's, let's have the two Doug's lead us off on on and bring us home on on what we're seeing on pricing. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Matt. We've talked about a number of really interesting dynamics on this panel, right? The COVID dynamics of chip shortages, steel shortages, manufacturing plants that you know, are slow to spin back up and meet the demand. We talked about climate change, needs for equipment, whether it's the Gulf Coast, the Northeast. You, you, uh, Matt, you mentioned California. We've got, wa we've got water issues. We've got fire issues. These create demands for equipment, right? The way we, to a certain degree, address climate change dynamics is with equipment. It's part of the recovery process. Um, I mentioned earlier, we're approaching record highs in the rental market, another constraint. Uh, Bob and Ron talked about construction's picking up, oil and gas is picking back up. We've got continued work happening. Lumber prices are settling back down to sort of normal levels. Uh, and all of this absent an infrastructure plan. So, you know, I almost look at this and say, independent of what happens in Washington today, wow, there's a lot of you know gas in the tank here that's driving really strong equipment pricing in this market. And the, the lines that you see on the page here on the auction side, uh, auction values up 11% across the board on dirt equipment. If we if we filtered this chart down to just dirt equipment, it would be something north of 30% high. Uh, all of these sort of really strong recoveries are a byproduct of these trends that we've been talking about on this panel. And Doug, I think that's consistent with what you're seeing when you focus exclusively on the Ritchie Brothers Iron Planet sales. Is that right? Yeah, very consistent uh, for sure. And uh, to, to the to your point, whether or not it's the 10 or 11 percent growth of certain uh, construction assets, as you expand and look at different sectors as well, whether it be all our contractors have trucks as well. So they have water trucks, they have truck tractors, they have dump trucks, they have uh, agricultural tractors, they have discs, they have a little bit of everything as well that they require on their work sites. And we're seeing the pricing of all those types of assets do very do something very similar. On the transportation side, over the road, freight is up. When you look at things as easy as van trailers, reefer vans, transport trucks, those types of assets are they're up 50% year over year. It's amazing. 
And because of the different shortages we've seen, and, and again, whether it's the chip shortage, whether it's the steel shortage, the labor shortage, uh, the OEM production, everything we're seeing, um, there's no, right at this point right now, we don't see anything to slow it down. If anything, it's probably going to escalate. We've talked to, to end users and contractors recently where they can get a quote on a piece of equipment, but they sure as heck can't get a delivery date. People are talking well into 2022, maybe even near the end of 2022 for certain assets. So the things we're experiencing today, the pricing on all our platforms, I think we're going to continue to see that as demand even goes gets stronger. And, and Doug, just to pop in here on that question, but before, you know, from one of our um, uh, audience members, you know, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the, you know, the the supply, maybe demand imbalance between the U.S. and Canada. Are, are we seeing a lot you know, U.S. buyers in the Canadian auctions or, or not? Yeah, we are, Matt. I mean, obviously, we track that as well. We track where the registrations are from by country, by state, by province and so forth. And yeah, I would say for sure as we've seen the end users uh, take auction pricing um, higher and we see more end user participation, we're seeing that expanding reach of our marketing draw more buyers and bidders in. And what that does, it just drives the local values up and means to Ron's point, those local contractors have to pay more for that D6 or that D8 or the 950 or the truck tractor. And we're seeing that competition uh, drive those prices up for sure. Excellent. Um, uh, you know, I think you know we we've 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 hit. Uh, I have to say, we've hit a lot of issues today, and I, you know, I know we've been uh, uh, we've been going at this for quite some time, and I, I you know, I did, this has been one of our more robust discussions on sort of these factors that are, you know, driving the nature of this pricing, right? With so much going on in the world today, um, uh, you know, I, I want to thank our our guests here today. Uh, just absolutely, you know, fascinating insights into, you know, whether it's, you know, college spending on education, whether it's the price of oil, I, you know, this is such a complex situation. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth, I mean, even for me, you know, you know, just sitting and listening to this, uh, you know, just a ton of insight here. So we want to thank everybody. Uh, you know, we're going to make this available via video. Uh, you know, we'll get it out there on social media. You can share it with other folks. You know, we'll cut it up into snippets. Uh, but, you know, really appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you for attending. Thank you for listening. And, you know, I, you know, with content like this, we'll just keep doing more and more of this because I think, you know, I think most people, you know, I'm getting texts from, you know, from people I know about moderating this. Just, just absolutely fascinating information and well done, everybody. So appreciate the time and uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.